Chicka brown, chicka brown cow. Hey, listeners, thanks for tuning back into another episode of the Wisco Weekly Podcast. I am here on location at the NADA convention, or, yeah, NADA convention at the Las Vegas Convention Center. Uh, I'm here with a gentleman that uh, is certainly going to be a different topic to discuss, but definitely a a most important topic because at the end of the day with dealerships having a physical location you still need to know how to organize it and certainly my guest today being an architect will be able to shed some light on the best way to provide a customer experience through your retail operation so Trent Clark is the head principal and, and architect of a plus design group Trent welcome to the show thank you uh, Trent tell us first off I guess just a little bit about your company uh, my firm is a, we're an architecture and interior design and planning firm based in Dallas, Texas, and we do work in all over the country. Right now we have projects in 20 states, and we travel well, and we, we work hard to make sure the customer is taken care of through all aspects of the design and construction phase. Excellent. So I thought for starters here, for those dealers that may not want to perhaps uh, go with a full board renovation, uh, of, you know, of their dealership. You, as an architect, could provide some tips on how a dealership can just better reorganize their showroom, based on what they currently have. Any tips that you could provide to a dealer with regards to how they can uh, rearrange their showroom, their their lot? Yes, a lot of it is just clarity of the space. The customer really wants to come into a space they feel welcoming. And a lot of older dealerships that we are, you know, have been renovating or currently renovating, uh, we focus on uh, where we can get more light into the space, uh, make it feel more comfortable, uh, get uh, furniture um, definitely, you know, upgraded, higher quality furniture that's clean and light and feels comfortable, uh, and then focus on the, this the space and the finishes of the space. We, we, you know, it might need new tile, it might need new wall surfaces, new lighting, new lighting inside. Uh, is very important. There's a lot of old yellow lighting and yellow ceilings that, you know, once you once you renovate those and clean those up and get new modern lighting, it helps the customer experience a lot. Lighting, uh, some touches with regards to tile, furniture, um, anything with regards to perhaps, uh, a, a, is, there, is there a layout perhaps that works well? I mean, you know, a lot of times you go into a showroom and there's all these cars that are always kind of in the way. Is is that a good thing, bad thing? It, it's something we see a lot uh, in both uh, the showrooms and also the retail spaces. Uh, we, we, you want to carve out spaces usually closer to the glass uh, for customers to hang out. Uh, give them a place to set. Get them in a place to that uh, another salesperson can come talk with them without having to kind of hide them through find find them through a maze. Uh, so it's good to carve out spaces. Don't cram the whole front of the car dealership with um, with cards, and the customer, you know, just can't find their way to a comfortable place to be. Spread the cards out, give them more room, and don't put them on, you know, seating in a main pathway where everybody else is coming through them and they feel like they're in the way. So carve them out of space, make them feel comfortable. I like that. I like that. Uh, so you've done. You, you said your um, uh, your company has been involved in projects in 20 different states. Um, what? Tell me, what would be your most um, I call it successful project that you are your most proudest project you've worked on? Well, I'd have to say our proudest projects are probably our last one uh, because we we really strive to make each project better. And uh, we're currently working on two brand new projects that are coming out of the ground. And brand new projects have a lot of new stuff that it makes it a little bit easier because, you know, you, there is a lot of clarity. But at the same time, we have a project com- that's being constructed right now, which is a facility that was built in the 70s. And very low ceilings, very dark, uh, not inviting at all. And the dealer gave us the opportunity to you know what can we do with this now that we need to renovate it what can we do can we make it great and my response was we can make this place fantastic we just have to make some some sizable changes to the inside and how the ceiling heights and how the lighting works and that project is coming is is completing right now and the dealer has two identical dealerships 
they were built at the same time. If you walk from one to the other, the other one is just so much more inviting and feels better. The lighting's great. So I'm, I'm sure we're going to be renovating the other one shortly. <laughs> uh, and are you allowed to disclose who, which dealership this is? Or? Probably not. Probably not. Okay, yeah. fair enough. Well, we'll have to stay tuned on your website to see who this dealership is. Now, yeah. uh, you know, one of the things that really intrigued me initially about your company was you've really carved out a niche in this car wash market. Uh, and now certainly after speaking with you, it to you could probably make you could probably make a case that you've become very scientific about it because you've done a good number of car washes. So first off, how did you get into the car wash niche market? Okay, well that was it, it's an interesting story. As a, it was a friend of a friend who knew a guy in the car wash industry who um, uh, needed help, and they had a project that was designed by an engineer. Uh, in San Antonio, Texas, and uh, he said, man, I need help. It doesn't look nice. It's I don't want to build this thing. And so he was trying to help the owner. So they reached out to me, and I'd never looked at a car wash before, uh, but he he explained to me everything that needed to happen in a car wash, and it was exciting. It was, I'm a car guy. I like mechanical stuff. I like machinery. And he would explain to me, we need a pipe from here to here for this, and we need the Florida slope from here to here for that. And we went through the entire process, and I was excited once we did that one car wash and we designed it from inside out we designed it with a guy who knows car washes he's been doing it for 20 years and then all of a sudden it just kind of grew from there uh, we did that one that year we did two the next year three or four the next year and then i realized you know there's no one in the car wash industry that's actually serving the client to make these into great car washes they're just building buildings and calling it a car wash so we decided to serve it now is there so the, uh, the the owner of the car wash, he was the one that was more into cars, or, or were, were you were you talking about yourself that you're into cars? Talking about me. You're talking yeah, about, yeah, that okay. was my deal. So, yeah, yeah so I, actually, I guess let's kind of dive into a little bit about who you are then. So, um, where what are your passions and interests? Uh, one of them really quickly is cars. I, I've, I've always, since I was a kid, I, I put my first vehicle together uh, it was a 1947 Ford pickup, and when I was 15 years old, I bought it, and it was in pieces, and I didn't even know at that time we didn't have internet, so I didn't even know what a 47 Ford truck looked like. And so my dad and I, we put it in the back of a trailer and, the, and two pickup trucks and hauled everything home, and by the time I was 16 and a half, I had built a truck. And, oh, and so we built a truck, and I still own that truck today. Really? Yes. Why? Would you please send me pictures of that? Or you, sure. can, you have yeah. to post that somewhere. Yeah, I, I, yeah. I love it, that. It's going through uh, stage 3.0 right now. It's it's uh, a little bit more high performance. It's lowered. Then, it's it's loud. So it's pretty cool right now. And, and so it, it's going through stage three. When will stage three finish approximately? Th this summer. Wow. Yeah, it'll be cool. It's fun. Holy cow. So aside from, so you put together cars, what are some other things that you've torn up or had to build up from scratch that that is outside of uh you know uh, your what you currently do now of course we'll, we'll eventually get yeah. to now well construction is one of those things my dad was a contractor my okay. dad built buildings and uh so i grew up in a construction family my my brother's still in the industry and so i grew up with a tool belt on and i was always building things so carpentry and and uh, uh, building homes, building buildings. I'm one of the few architects out there that understands the construction industry extremely well. So when I put together a set of construction documents, I know how to build it. I don't, I'm not just putting things on a piece of paper. And so that's one of my passions is I want a building that's going to be very useful, very functional and put together well. So we spend a lot of extra time when we're, when we, our buildings are being built on the site to make sure everything's going well. Is there a particular material at the moment that you like to work with? Uh, there's there's lots of material. I mean, I'm a, I'm a modern architect. I can okay. design any style, but, you know, if, if I were to build my own car wash, it would just be steel and glass okay. And uh, okay. because that's fun and it's exciting to me. Yeah. Uh, we have done one in Santa Rosa, California. It's very close to that, which yeah. is an exciting building. Um, but, you know, I like I like more industrial look yeah. i like more Same more here. yeah i think a lot i think a lot of guys like yeah. that industrial yeah. kind of look and feel to it yeah um so steel and glass um and and you describe yourself as a modern architect um any any influences on how you 
became the modern architect that you are now? Well, I think a lot of it comes from your schooling. I, I went to Oklahoma State, and Oklahoma State was a very... Go Cowboys. Yeah, that's right. Very uh, go Pokes, you know. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So it was very much of a uh, modern... The professors were very modern. Okay. And uh, so they taught us that style. And then I didn't really understand it, though, until I started working an internship with an architect out of Tulsa, Oklahoma. And that man was... He was a modernist too, but he loved every style because, and he could explain it. And so he and I, in my internship, we would drive around and look at buildings uh, for on lunch break or stuff. And he'd look at a building that was a very traditional or neoclassical or something, and, and he would explain to me why that building was so good. Yeah. And he helped me appreciate all the other styles, even though he was a very modern architect as well. Well, I think it's only appropriate then to further get your thoughts on all these pseudo buildings here in Las Vegas uh, I mean if we're taking a look at some of these establishment these buildings these hotels in Vegas what would be some of the ones that you personally like and why uh, one of them is I like the win because I just like the simplicity of the buildings okay. uh, are they exciting no but what's in what's housed around them and how they hit the ground and what do you mean how they hit the ground? Well, how, they, how the building touches the ground. It's very important on a building. You don't want it just to slam into a piece of earth and be very boring. It's very brutalist in a way. Okay. But you like it to, to where the landscaping was thought out, the sidewalks were thought out. Everything where it touches the ground is gentle and and uh, easy to, you want to walk up to the building. Uh -huh, you don't uh -huh. want it, it doesn't scare you actually. away. I see that. Uh, the design center is one building, I think. It's kind of the one that looks like a UFO landed on the top. Um, I don't know which one that is. Oh. Yeah, it's right across from right, the right wind. Across, right, yeah. Right, right. yeah, And yeah. it's a fantastic building. That's a new one. Yeah. yeah T okay. Totally opposite approach. Okay. But, you know, it looks like the UFO landed across the street, and then the buildings just float underneath it. Okay. And uh, so it's a it's a and it's very glass front, a lot of really cool stuff. But it's it's a great one for Vegas, where the the designer was thinking about I'm setting up a building here, and people watching is awesome in Vegas. And so if I set up these restaurants and all these other places where everybody could look out and see the strip and see everything moving, it it, it, it makes a show out of the building. So they set up like a little theater there. Have you gotten any kind of? Uh I mean, what, what's the what's the oddest request for a building project that you have received? Uh, about two years ago, I had a client. He was a doctor that came to us, and he wanted an office building that looked like the Alamo in Texas, in San Antonio. Okay. And we were just like, why would you want to do that? And so he, he had this whole theory that, you know, he was a mission. He was a good Christian man, and I believe it's my mission to help other people. And I go to other countries, and I help them with their medical needs. And so I just want my building to look like the Alamo. And, you know, it, it was painful to design <laughs> because, trust me, that wasn't – I don't like to knock off anything. But, you know, and we didn't knock it off, but we, we gave it some accents that made it feel like, to him, it was the Alamo. And we built it, and but I still drive by it from time to time and just kind of shake my head like, I can't believe I designed that. But that was what the client wanted. That's what the client wanted. And, and yeah, he's sure. excited. He has to go to it every day, and he can be proud of that building. And that's one thing I try to do with my buildings. I always tell my clients, you're going to go into that building every day, and that's your building. I'm not going to design a building to get myself awards and make myself sure. feel great. I want it to be your building that you're proud to go into every day. Uh, you know, with regards to these you know, all of these buildings, car washes, dealerships. Um, can you walk me through the process of you looking at a, sp or, you know, I, I guess if, if somebody's looking to hire you, so what are the steps to say, Trent, I, this is what I'm looking for. Okay, you're on. What, what do you, what, what's your uh, role or, or what's your thought process in, in putting together a redesign or, or just building a, a, a dealership, for instance? I guess the, the, the first thing is to understand how the dealer or the car wash operator wants to operate because everybody has a certain way that they like to operate and it affects how you program the space, how you lay out the space, how you circulate around the space. And, a, and a, you can't just cookie cutter. I like to make sure to really listen well to what the client wants because you know their service department no we, we we like to work this way 
So then how do we create that customer experience that works great while they're going that way, while the customer feels good going that direction? So it's really getting into the head of the, the dealer or the car wash operator and then uh, then solving that problem of how you do that. And you know, uh, one of the things you had mentioned before was with regards to car washes that there is a single entry point and so you can't really, you don't want to obfuscate anything that would deter anyone from not knowing where that entry point is. I, I, I'm probably messing up what you what you said there, but can you explain how when you start to lay out, let's say for instance, a car wash, what are the, the key points that you're kind of, you know, uh, basing an entry exit pattern off of? The, the, the biggest thing on a car wash is just clarity of circulation throughout the site. Okay. People okay. have to immediately from the road when they're going to pull into a car wash, know exactly where they're driving to. Where, the, where is the cashier station? Where do I start? And so that's number one, the clearest thing. But then you have to, as they go through that, how they enter the car wash is pretty well guided at that point. But then when they exit the car wash, again, what's the clarity of where they're going from there? Are they going to get extra services? Are they going to vacuum out the car themselves? How do they clearly know which direction to go? So because if, if you let people have to think too long, then they clog up the line. God, I got to tell you, I... I don't know how, somehow, some way we can try to get your thoughts instilled in a lot of dealerships because the reality is, is that be it if you're going to a dealership to buy a car, test drive a car, when you pull up to a dealership, parking is always, always a big issue at a dealership, which many a times a customer has turned around because it was not evident of where to go uh, with regards to parking, right? Because it's confusing, you have so many cars around you. So it's like, which, where are the cars that are designated for me as a customer? Where are the cars that are designated for, for the dealership? And then even with the service drive too. I, I know I may be asking a repetitive and, and probably a billion dollar question, but is there is there a solution that you can propose to that? Yeah, yeah, there is. On Hire a, you? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> on, on, a, on a new car wash, it's it's simpler, and it's uh, it's your what they call the wayfinding system, which is signage on the site when you enter a site. It says enter here. When they they start entering into the the site, there's a arrow that says customer parking over here or service over here. Uh, it's real simple to create a wayfinding system of small signs that direct people where they should go. The other one is just like a car watch, it needs to be clear. It needs to be where, you know, it. when you enter the site, you know exactly where it's at. You don't have to go hunt through, kind of like what I was hunting through yesterday trying to park my Hertz car in the Las Vegas Venetian uh, parking garage. You know, I, I didn't have any way, yeah, wayfinding. Yeah, it was, it was just kind of gone. And then all of a sudden, poof, after, you, after I made enough wrong turns, I found it. You can't do that in a car. You don't want to do that in a car wash. You don't want to do that when you have a customer that wants to come up and buy a car from you. Uh, you need to show them. Another thing is dealers tend to, you know, you live your life around how many cars you can park on a site, but you need to make the customer's parking areas bigger, wider, easier to get into, easier to get out. Which, I mean, I, if, I, if I'm understanding you correctly to a certain extent, then you're more or less suggesting that all the cars that a dealership would have on their lots hey, dealer, you may not want to have all those cars immediately. Keep it on your excess storage lot then, and so therefore allow greater parking for your customers. Right, yeah. It, it's, it's, easy to, to, uh, it's easy for me to say, hey, dealer, you know, we need 10 more really defined customer parking spaces in front of your building when the dealer says no, but i you know, I, I got to keep those out front. I can't sell them. But it, and it, and it, it is a struggle. We struggle all the time. We'll have 700 parking spaces on a spot, and a dealer, you know, just can't quite give up two you know and I'm like come on we got to give up two because it'll make the site better we have to get rid of two spaces well certainly I mean again I think one of the things that I'm, I'm, I'm most interested about and, and hopefully this gets across is that everybody always talks about technology solving the customer experience technology this technology that people are gonna buy cars online you're not gonna go to a dealership well that's not gonna be, that's that's we're still a ways away from that customers will still go to a dealership and certainly when there when there still is friction in the process that can be easily resolved 
if they can, if on one hand dealers can relinquish the older mindset of, oh, well, I need to have all of my inventory accessible. If they can let go some of those old adages, then it would provide for a better customer experience. Yes, it would. It, re it really would. And it's, it's giving up a little bit just to allow your customer to have a better experience. And I think it's worth it. Um, Tell me about your so your your company is how many how many how much how many staff do you have? We're nine people. Nine people. Yeah. Um, relatively small. Yeah, oh, we're a small okay, we're a small okay. shop. Tell me about who who your staff is. Okay, we we have we have on staff we have project managers, and uh, they're responsible for taking a project. We we assign projects to uh, three different project managers as as they come in, and then sometimes I take one myself to a certain point. Uh, but they're in charge of that project, contacting the client, the engineers, the city, all, all the pieces and parts and carry that through. Uh, we all support each other as well when we have uh, you know, an odd condition or something that somebody else might have more experience in. Um, we also have, there's, there's two architects in the office that are designers. And so we design, they design the buildings, I'm one of them. I design a good majority of the projects in our, in our office. Um, is that because it's your company and you love that process? Or? Not well. I love the process, but no, I don't want to do it. I don't. I don't try to control it uh, okay. or hold it tight. It's just I'm very fast uh, just with my design and my other architect that designs as well. He's he's getting better, and uh, then we have another project manager that's pretty good at design too. So we'll let anybody design, uh, but I always try to fit them to what is best for their skill set and the project hits their skill set well. So we make sure the customer's taken care of. And then we also have, we have an interior designer this full time and she's fantastic. Uh, she even does more than interior. She helps us coordinate interior and exterior materials, make sure we're all uh, doing a good job with material selection and color. It's interesting that only one interior designer, is that is that kind of typical to have, you know, more or less one interior designer to whatever, every, a multiple of, of, of architects yes it is it okay. is there's uh, interiors can be a small portion of the job hmm. and so while one project architect could be handling four or five projects she could probably in the same time be handling eight or nine projects because it's a smaller scope of services that she has to provide is there a favorite um, what has been a, a favorite experience on year-end to visit a location uh, I guess probably, I mean, just recently we we went to we've done several car washes here in the Vegas area. Okay. And uh, two of them are operating. The third one's under construction, and it was fantastic to go out there and see the site, uh, see the building being operated very well. Uh, customers coming through it very easily. Uh, the building's crisp and clean. Seeing the employees that, when I say, hey, I'm the architect, you know, we did this building, and they look at it and they say, wow, this building's fantastic. It's the best looking car wash we've ever seen. And, and for, for all you out there also, I mean, uh, I was gonna plug this later on, but certainly, you know, you, you do want to visit uh, their Facebook page. Um, their, oh God, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank now. It's, uh, uh, what was your Facebook page? I don't know either. <laughs> what, was it? what was your Facebook page again? Heidi would know. Yeah, Heidi. Anyhow, they, that's why they, I have Heidi around. If, if you go to uh, APDG dot US, US yeah. uh, you can eventually get to their Facebook page, in yeah. which uh, you can then find their, their car wash. And, and even actually on your website, you have some awesome pictures. I mean, the pictures that you have of those wash of, of those car washes, I'm so envious because in Southern California, where uh, room and space is coveted. Uh, I, I would certainly love a car wash like that in Southern California that I would like to visit because it's it's a total hangout. It, you know, in my in my head, there's there's this image in my head that I'd like to develop this kind of guys playground in which part of it would be a car wash, yeah, part sure. of it would be kind of like an outdoor basketball court weight room area. But the car wash would definitely be part of it. And, and certainly when when I when I saw your designs, I'm like that's that would those would be the car washes that I would want. Yeah. So. Um, What is what? What's next for you as an architect? I mean, you know, in, in terms of professionally, do you is there any upcoming projects that you um, that you would like to have? Uh, well, I, I guess being an architect, you, you're you're fascinated and you're in love with design. So uh -huh. anything that's a challenge is fantastic. Interesting. Um, 
you know, I've, I've done sports stadiums. I've done all kinds of, you know, things. I, I've done one sports stadium, but we did an awesome job. We got awards for it. First one we'd which, ever which done. One? It's Chattanooga Mox, okay. Chattanooga Stadium in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Okay. And I did that with another firm. Okay. But, you know, I was an intern th- then, and it was like, oh, hey, you're awesome. going to do a stadium. I'm like, cool, bring it yeah. on. Yeah. So, uh, but we've done all, we, we did, you know, last year we did a really knockout gun range and uh, a, a, a multi-use center for that it had training areas it had a karate uh, a martial arts area a training center a store it was 43,000 square feet is a very large range it was exciting we'd never done one I'd love to do more of those because they're fun is there is there some kind of a philosophy that you you go by um, when you go into when you go into your creative process and start designing stuff yeah I guess probably the biggest rule is uh, really just keep it simple okay. I, I like to keep I like simple buildings even though some of my buildings people people look at them and go wow that's the Taj Mahal but you look at them and go yeah but all the pieces on it are simple they're well thought out they're uh, I kind of aching it to kind of the way the you know the iPhone is set up or or the Tesla it's just simple it's uh, it's a very simple look it didn't go overboard to bring attention to it 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 gets attention because it's simple parts put together well. Is there, you know, if, if I'm sure at some point, like every architectural era, it comes to an end, and certainly this modernist era will come to an end. Do you have any idea? Can you forecast what the next era of architecture will be? Well, it's kind of kind of interesting now. I we're we're, we're, con, we're currently in what's called the postmodern era, mm-hmm. and. Uh, the postmodern era actually and actually let's let's back up one postmodern era can describe you know uh, i i kind of know what it is i have a certain idea of what it is but from an architect i'd like to hear a little bit more of what your technical definition of what postmodern era is okay well the modern era typically is when you saw a lot of classical buildings that's when back in the greek and roman times that was considered modern architecture back then the postmodern is after that and that's when you had a lot of influence from Europe uh, called the De Style Group and things like that that went back to steel and brick and glass and and tried to keep things very simple and clean. And so that's the postmodern area, and we're really still in it. There's a lot of other styles that have jumped in and out of this current postmodern era, but they didn't last very long. Some were called deconstructivist area era. I heard of that. Yeah, yeah they you know kind of came in and went out because it just it just wasn't rational. And it, so that was just a subset of <clears throat> postmodernism. It it was okay. it was it was just some people that said hey let's shake this up mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and let's try something else mm-hmm. and uh, you know and then there were other postmodernists that you know decided to start making buildings kind of cartoonish you know and try and 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 uh, Michael Graves was one of the architects that jumped into that one and and his buildings are neat but you look at them today and go oh I don't think I would have done that Hmm. Um, but uh, but you know right now we're kind of going more into an industrial modern is what I call it because people are going uh, all of your buildings you look at you look at just current architecture that's popping up from from Starbucks or uh, a, a Apple store or whatever it's getting very industrial and streamlined and clean, and but that's still a modern type, uh, postmodern type movement, but it's more industrial. Uh, you know, out of curiosity, so uh, my wife is uh, originally from the Czech Republic, and we get to go visit often, and so we get to take a look at all the buildings, all these Gothic era type buildings, and and you know the attention to detail, as it has lasted through time, is quite impressive. One of the conversations that uh, she and I had with regards to postmodernism is when it comes down to the, the postmodernism, postmodernism uh, look and feel, do you think at some point when you fast forward 50 years, 500 years down the road that these would be buildings that would be more or less torn down because of that minimalist look? It's like, well, oh, it's very minimalist, done, so we can... We can put something else uh, up on there, something that's more futuristic kind of thing. Yeah, things like that will happen. Yeah. It, it just, it's just part of it. Oh, you know, okay. that, that's what I get paid now. I, I, I get to look at these buildings that were built in the 70s yeah. and or 60s, and people are like, Ugh, you know, what do we do with them? Back then, they were awesome. They were cool. And yeah, I, I look at them, it, yeah. and, and, and I go, okay, we got to do this. we got to do that to them. And, yeah, someone's going to put, you know, lipstick on some of my buildings at some point and, and doll them up. And, and, and I've seen people do it, and I've seen people then – 
come 20 years later and take all that stuff back off like oh the bones of this building were so great why did they do that you know why did they feel like they had to put all this traditional stuff on it so I, I, I think it's always going to be uh, yeah, ebb and flow, and it depends on the architect, depends on the owner. Yeah. Um, do you have any influencers um, when it comes to your your professional, you know, the professional side of you? Any architects? Any? Um, I don't know. Maybe not philosophers, but who, who are some of your influencers? Well, some of the great architects that you study uh, in school, and uh, you know, Corbusier, Le Corbusier, who's a French architect that. You know, it was a very, you know, he pretty much brought in the, that modern, real defined, simple, modern look. Okay. Uh, very well known, uh, Corbusier. Uh, Louis Kahn was a great art architect, fantastic. Richard Meyer, uh, you know, everything's white and everything's very gridded, but, you know, he still could create spaces with it and could get excited. Antoine Predock is out of New Mexico, and, and his, his affinity for the textures of simple materials and how he put them together in a very clean fashion was has always inspired me. Interesting. Okay. Um, well, Trent, thank you very much for, for sharing some of your knowledge and insight, and, and, and thank you for spending the time and, and me getting to know you. Um, how can people get in touch with you? Uh, you can get in touch with us uh, first by just looking at our website, which is aplusdesigngroup.us. And, or actually APDG.us, APDG. I'm sorry, it used to be that, yeah. APDG.us, and uh, you can, of course, like we talked about, check out our Facebook page and stuff there. Uh, our phone number, of course, is 972-724-4440. Uh, Heidi's always there to answer the phone, and we, we are actually an office that people answer the phone. So you might even get me answering the phone. If it rings it rings three times, no uh, one picked you, it up. You guys we, could be so lucky yeah, if you guys answer. we all pick it up, man. So uh, we make sure we answer the phone and take care of you, and and uh, help you out and certainly uh you know if you guys are looking for a complete redesign or again even just starting off which i would recommend to a lot of you uh with just your parking situation or maybe just uh, your internal car wash um, look at some of his designs that he made and of course he's up for the challenge of working in smaller spaces to design a car wash that would serve both your customers and your staff Um, so check out his work uh APDG.us and, and his Facebook. Trent, thank you so, so much for being on my podcast. Um, I hope we'll get to do this again, and hopefully once that other project finishes, uh, we'll get to know the name, and then we can talk about it in hindsight of uh, some of the things that you did with that with that project. Very good. That well, well, so you're, you're very welcome. It was fun. Listeners, as always, thank you very much for tuning in to this episode of the Wisco Weekly Podcast. As always, rate, review, and subscribe. Uh, you can visit us on Facebook and Twitter, Wisco Weekly Pod. And as we always end an episode, cheers, pros, lahaim, kipish, nastravi, salud, kampai to the customer experience. <laughs>